continuing with minimal polynomials. We use them to characterize the matrices that can be put in diagonal form. First, let's recall some definitions. We start with V, a finite dimensional vector space over some field F. We'll have a linear transformation T that carries V to V. Then when we choose a basis, we get an associated matrix A. Okay, A will be an N by N matrix with entries in our field. First big result, we have the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, which states if we put A into the characteristic polynomial for A, we get the zero matrix out. From there, we could ask if there's a polynomial of smallest degree, such that this happens, and that's gonna be the minimal polynomial. So the result we have here, there exists a unique monic polynomial, m sub a of x, such that we have m sub a of a gives a zero matrix, and if Q is a monic polynomial, such that Q of A is zero, then we must have that M sub A divides Q. And that's what we mean by smallest polynomial. Now, with that, we were also able to show that M sub A and P sub A have the same irreducible factors. So once we have the characteristic polynomial, our possibilities for the minimal polynomial are limited. For here, we want to characterize matrices that can be put in diagonal form in terms of the minimal polynomial. So we have theorem. There exists a base of eigenvectors for f of n with respect to a. Okay, so that just means a can be put in diagonal form. If and only if, m sub a factors into distinct linear factors. So that means if we take m sub a of x, okay, we write it as x minus numbers, Okay, multiply them out. The lambda sub i's are gonna be distinct. Okay, all the exponents are gonna be equal to one. Now, for some distinguishing examples, okay, let's consider the diagonal matrix A given by one, one, two. Here we have the characteristic polynomial x minus one squared, x minus two. The minimal polynomial will be x minus one times x minus two. So note here, we don't need this extra factor because if I subtract off that one once, we get rid of these. They go to zero. On the other hand, if I take A equal to the Jordan block 1101, here we have the characteristic and minimal polynomials equal. Okay, so our theorem doesn't apply here. This matrix is not diagonalizable. And if we look for the eigenspace for eigenvalue equal to one, we see that we're only gonna have a one-dimensional space. So that means there won't be a basis of eigenvectors. For the proof, we start with a straightforward direction. So we're assuming we have a basis of eigenvectors. We wanna show the minimal polynomial factors into distinct linear factors. First, we need a preliminary step. So I'll have that if A and B are similar, then their minimal polynomials are equal. So similarity, that just says B equals P A P inverse. And we could think of this as just being a change of basis in terms of the original linear transformation. Now what that says, because we have M A equal to M B, this minimal polynomial doesn't depend on the basis that we're using. So this is really a minimal polynomial for the original linear transformation. For warm up, let's show the same result for the characteristic polynomials. So I want to show that PA equals PB. Characteristic polynomial of B, okay, by definition, determinant XI minus B. We'll substitute. Then I can factor out a P and a P inverse to each side to get three terms in the determinant. Okay, so you just multiply this out and then we get this. Now we can use the multiplicative property of determinant to get three determinants. And then determinant P, determinant P inverse, cancel out to give a one. So I'm left with the characteristic polynomial of A, and that's what we were looking for. For the minimal polynomials, same idea, except different explanation. I'll start with MB on B, gives us zero. We substitute. Then we can pull the P and the P inverse to the outside of the MB. Now the reason we could do that, if we write MB 
as a matrix polynomial. Okay, we're gonna be taking powers of PAP inverse. When I do that, okay, you write out the product. The PP inverses cancel out on the inside to leave us with P A to a power P inverse. We collect all our terms, and then the P and the P inverse pull to the outside, leaving us with the polynomial in A. Now from here, I multiply on this side by P, this side by P inverse, they get absorbed by the zero, and then I have MB on A is equal to zero. By the definition of the minimal polynomial for A, okay, we have a polynomial carrying A to zero. We must have that MA divides MB. Now, if we rework the argument, we'll also have MB divides MA. And because these are monic, we must have that they're equal. So that's our preliminary result. Now, we have a base of eigenvectors, so let's just consider A with respect to that basis. So we could just assume that A is already diagonal. For a result, we just need to note how we multiply diagonal matrices together. So the key is, when we multiply, we're just gonna multiply the diagonal entries in each row. So this is what it looks like in the two by two case. Now, I wanna take a product of diagonal matrices and get the zero matrix out. So what does that mean? That'll mean that at least one entry in this row in some matrix has to be equal to zero. Now, that'll happen if I use factors, all the form A minus lambda I, I. And we're gonna need each of these to make sure we pick off each eigenvalue going down the diagonal. So we need each of these at least once. Also note, we need these exactly once. Okay, if we take higher powers, it's not gonna make this thing go to zero any faster. We're just gonna be multiplying another zero in a given row where there's already a zero. So for the minimal polynomial, we just need each of these exactly once. For the complicated direction, we need to invoke Bazou's identity for polynomials over a field. So we've used this when we have two polynomials, but it'll hold in general. Now, we're assuming that our minimal polynomial factors into distinct linear factors. We want to show that there's a basis of eigenvectors. For a preliminary step, consider polynomials q sub i. So here I'm just going to take our minimal polynomial and we're going to strip off one of the linear factors. If I push this term to the other side, we substitute a for x, we get this equation here. So we're going to have that this product is the minimal polynomial evaluated at a, and we know that's equal to zero. Now one way to interpret this, if I apply qia to v, we're gonna hit it with this term and get zero. So that means QIA on V is in this kernel. Now, that's the same as saying QIA on V is zero, or it's an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda I. We'll also have, if I take any polynomial in A, multiply it by this vector here, we're still gonna have either zero or an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda I. And that's because we're considering polynomials in A. So everything commutes. Now, we invoke Bazou's identity. So what this says, if I have a collection of polynomials, say Fs, the greatest common divisor is equal to one. So we're just gonna consider the special case. Then we'll have a collection of polynomials R sub i, such that we have this identity here. The sum of R sub i, F sub i is equal to one. Now, our Q's are gonna satisfy the properties that we want with the F's, so we can invoke this. Now, that means we can find some R's, such as the sum R sub i Q sub i is equal to one. I'm gonna substitute A for X. So that means we'll have the sum R sub i A, Q sub i A is equal to the identity matrix. Now, we have a matrix equation. I'm gonna apply this to any vector in our vector space. So I'll have, say, v is equal to i times v is equal to this sum applied to v. Let's consider what's happening with each term. Well, we've already seen here, this is equal either to zero 
or an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda 1. And that's going to happen for each term applied to v, just for a different eigenvalue. So what we've shown is I can write any vector v in our vector space as either 0 or a sum of eigenvectors. Once I choose a basis for each eigenspace, that'll give us our basis of eigenvectors for the vector space, and that's our result. Here's a nice application of our result to group theory. We'll have A, n by n matrix over the complex numbers. A will satisfy the equation A to the m is the identity matrix for some positive integer m. Then our result says A is automatically diagonalizable over C. Now, because A to the m is equal to i, I can push the i to the other side, and then we have A satisfying this polynomial equation. So, that means the minimal polynomial of A divides x to the m minus 1. If we could show that x to the m minus 1 has distinct roots, then so will the minimal polynomial of A, and then we have a result. Now, to show this, there are two ways we can go. First, we just go directly using Dumas theorem and find all the roots. So using Dumas theorem, okay, if I have an equation like this, I'll put one in polar coordinates, so r is equal to one, theta is equal to zero. To take the nth roots, what we'll do is, I take the nth root of r, which gives a one, and then for all the other angles, we'll just have theta equal to, okay, our zero plus two pi k, divided by m. Now, the roots that'll come out of this, we're gonna have e to the two pi i divided by m raised to the kth power, where k is between zero and m, including the zero. So that's gonna give us m distinct roots. If we didn't have access to Dumas theorem, we could also find our answer by just checking the derivative. So if we're looking for multiple roots of polynomials, the test is, okay, f of x is going to have a multiple root at x0 if the derivative of f at x0 is equal to 0. Now, this is just an application of the product rule. So if I have f of x with some multiple root x0, then I can write in the form x minus x0 raised to the kth power times g of x, another polynomial, all that k is greater than or equal to 2. We take the derivative, we apply the product rule. Each term that comes out has an x minus x zero. So if I put x zero in there, zero comes out, and that's our result. Now, if we check with x to the m minus one, okay, two things we want to note. If I take the derivative, okay, we'll have m times x to the m minus one. So the only zero we can get from the derivative is at x equal to zero itself. Now, if we put zero into the original polynomial, we get a minus one, so zero is not a root. So that means if you're not equal to zero, then the derivative is non-zero at that root. So every root is distinct. For a concrete example, let's consider the following three by three permutation matrix. Okay, so if you check directly, the a cubed is equal to the identity, We'll also have the characteristic and minimal polynomials of A are equal. Okay, both of those are x cubed minus 1. So the two things we want to check. First, the x cubed minus 1 has distinct roots. And then that'll imply that A is diagonalizable. Now, if I factor x cubed minus 1, okay, 1 is a root, so we take off an x minus 1. That leaves x squared plus x plus 1. We could factor this using the quadratic equation. So the roots will be minus a half plus minus square root of three over two i. Now, in the notation of the previous board, we have e to the two pi i divided by three. I'll call that omega. Second root, that'll be equal to e to the four pi i divided by three, which is the same as complex conjugate of omega or omega squared. Now, if we plot these roots on the unit circle. Okay, they're gonna be evenly spaced by two pi thirds, so they're all distinct. And that's the check in our work. Okay, so if we have a complete set of roots of unity, they're evenly spaced around the unit circle. Now, for the basis of eigenvectors, okay, we proceed as usual. 
So for eigenvalue one, here we're gonna set up null of a minus xi. Okay, and here we're putting in one for x. We write it out, we do some row operations, we find the null space. Okay, we get the span of the vector one, one, one. We check that one, one, one's an eigenvector. So I apply a, what comes out is just one, one, one itself. So that's a multiple of our vector, okay, and that multiple is one, which is the eigenvalue. So that checks. For x equal to omega, okay, a little bit trickier. So we set up as usual, okay, we write it out. We do a little bit of row reduction, okay, and to get past this step, I'll need that omega cubed is equal to one. Then to get our null space from here, we'll need the equation one plus omega plus omega squared is zero. We do our work, and then we get the span of omega one omega squared. We check our work as before. So I take a times our vector, so we get omega squared, omega one. I want that to be equal to our eigenvalue times the original vector. So to check, I'm just gonna do that. Take the eigenvalue of omega, multiply it by the original vector. That'll be equal to the vector we got out when we applied a. So that checks. I'll leave the third vector to you. So for eigenvalue x equal to omega squared or complex conjugate of omega, show that omega squared one omega is an eigenvector for that eigenvalue. And then we'll have our diagonalizing basis.